the last panel of uh, this day, a panel uh, in this context of synesthetic syntax, sounding uh, uh, animation and visualizing audio. So this panel is entitled Kinesthetics of Music and Vision. The panel features three uh, speakers uh, from with a very with a broad background, so various uh, um, uh, interesting topics, and they are addressing um, topics like a return to the material and movements and gestures. Questions are how can historic and contemporary practice uh, demonstrate synesthetic syntax? How can kinesthetic gesture be explored to create new kind of audiovisual experiences? And how can the appeal of analog, the haptic feedback and the analog experience be brought together in the audiovisual? The first speaker is Joao Pedro Oliveira. He is a composer, visual artist, and professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, Department of Music. He holds multiple degrees in various areas in architecture, organ performance, music, and composition, composition so very broad background. Oliveira's work includes over 100 compositions published in various countries. In competition, Oliveira has been highly successful. He got uh, 50, more than 50 prizes and honorary mentions. Uh, in his presentation, he will talk about uh, gestural interaction between sound and image. This presentation analyzes several possibilities of interaction between image and movement and sound under the perspective of gestural and textual relations. Oliviera presents several examples from the cinema repertoire as well uh, as some examples that he did uh, in the field of audiovisual experiments. Fred Kolobi, the second speaker, is a professor emeritus of design and innovation at Case Western Reserve University. He published in the areas of visual instrument design, managing as designing, forecasting methodology, and information technology. The title of his presentation is Visualizing Synthesizer Design, Where Modern Arts Was Headed. Kolobi is going to discuss his approach to visual synthesizer design, in particular, how the history of abstract visual art has influenced audiovisual art. And he will discuss very, various approach, uh, approaches and also uh, to contemporary uh, projects. Eric Dyer is an artist. He brings animation into the physical world with his sequential sculptures and installations. His work has been widely exhibited at galleries, events, and venues worldwide. Also at Ars Electronica, I think uh, eight years ago. Uh, he teaches visual arts and animation at University of Maryland, Baltimore country, and has been visiting artists at institutions at CalArt and Carnegie Mellon University. Dyer will uh, talk about his uh, project, his approaches, physical presence and material desi desire based on his sculptural interactive installations and perform formative animation art practice. So after this three presentation, there is a live uh, discussion. So please join us. Uh, and you have the possibility to leave messages, uh, um, add questions in, in the forum. So you're cordially invited to join the three panels, the, the three presentation and the panel discussions. See you later. For many years I have worked as a composer and I was very much interested in the relationship between instrumental sound and electronic sound. Later on I started working with image and I thought about what type of relationships I could get from the connection between instrumental and electronic sounds that could be transposed or transformed into the connection between sound and image. 
one of my interests is the idea of musical gesture. Defining musical gesture is a very complex task and there are many answers for that and many proposals. Probably the most interesting of them comes from the theoretician Robert Hutton and the composer and also theoretician Dennis Smalley. Hutton defines gesture as any energetic shaping through time that may be interpreted as significant. It may be created or interpreted in any medium or channel and it may entail any sensory perception, motor action or their combination. Smalley also talks about this idea, defining it as an action directed away from a previous goal or towards a new goal and is concerned with the application of energy and its consequences. It is synonymous with intervention, growth and progress and married to causality. Following Hatton's definition, human gesture can be defined as an energetic shaping through time and that will be interpreted as significant. And, as we will see, his definition includes not only all variety of significant human motion and their perception, but also the translation of energetic shaping through time into humanly physically produced or interpreted sounds. If we go a step further and transpose this idea to a context where musical gesture is not dependent on physical gesture, such as the case of traditional acousmatic or electroacoustic music, musical gesture in its relation to the transformations in energy, can acquire different and interesting meanings. In traditional cinema, usually gesture in image has a direct translation in sound. But in experimental video or cinema, that relation may not exist. As musical gestures emerge from musical elements including articulation, dynamics, pitch, duration, Hutton believes that any listener will understand gestural meanings intuitively. If this is true, then it is very possible to find connections between gesture in sound and image that can have multiple meanings or go beyond the simple translation of one into the other. Our intuition can lead to very interesting and varied interpretations of the phenomena we are describing. Our first example comes from a very well-known movie scene. Let's watch it. Much has been said about the music in this scene. Many people relate the high-pitched sounds in the strings to the cries of the young woman who is being murdered, low sounds that come in the middle of the scene and they stop little by little, they have been also connected with the idea of a heartbeat that stops, and so on. But for us musicians who have an understanding of what is happening in the score, and the type of physical gesture that is required to produce the music we are hearing, we can certainly go beyond these interpretations. If we take a look at the score, we are talking about a simple repeated note on the strings, but the physical gesture that is required to play this section is very much similar to what is happening in the scene. Let's watch how a violinist would play this excerpt. So intuitively, 
looking at the violinist playing this and knowing this will be the gesture, the physical gesture that is necessary to perform this section, we can almost interpret that the orchestra is somehow collaborating in the murder by doing the same movements that the murderer is doing with the knife. This means that the musical gesture and the physical gesture take on metaphorical proportions which separately would never be attainable. Any energetic shaping through time, whether actual or implied, and whether intentional or unwitting, may be considered as a gesture if it may be interpreted as meaningful in some ways. This idea of being meaningful can be a model for the relationship between image and sound. If an image has an important meaning, sound may or may not support that meaning. Or, on the other hand, sound can give gestural meaning to an image that does not have it intrinsically, or amplify the meaning of the image. This also very famous scene shows how gesture, and we are referring to both physical and musical gesture, affects the musical path with the meaning that passes from the image to the sound. The work of Purcell in synthesized version of Carlos is disturbed by dissonances. At the same time, the young boy is hit by his former colleagues. These dissonances somehow amplify the meaning of the image not only by changing the path of the music, but creating strange sounds which imply an extreme violence. Musical gesture may also be related to the notion of causality, according to Smalley, and be concerned with the application of energy and its consequences. Or, if we mention Trevor Wishart's idea about gesture in music, it can relate to the communicative an expressive potential as an articulation of a continuum. So, this progression of time perception in what Wishart calls a continuum gets embedded with several hierarchical levels of many types of articulations that are determined by gestural disturbances. We can say that they are hierarchical because some are more significant than others. This example from the movie Constantine was pointed out to me by Paul Rudy, who analyzed it as a typical attack, decay, sustain, release form that is quite commonly used in music. 
However, I was interested in the idea of hierarchy. The notion of causality is reflected in the temporal suspension of the beginning of the scene, which will be completed at the end. We intuitively wait for this resolution, but until it happens, we are left with several lower-level hierarchy disturbances. Gestures possess articulate shape, hierarchical potential, smaller gesture, low-level category, for example, glass hitting Lucifer, and these can be subsumed by larger ones, higher level, the big gesture of the scene beginning to the end. When we mention gesture in music or image, we intuitively have the feeling of structural elements that can be determined by 1. transferring and carrying some kind of energy, 2. they may represent and induce specific emotions, 3. movement, going from one point to another. Gestures can have their own specific path in time, and movement can be marked as meaningful. And four, they can express something. When we think about movement, there are many interesting examples. This one is an example that tries to contradict precisely that idea. This is done by a limited or even non-existent energy change. In other words, both sound and image lose their gestures to become textural. The exaggerated movement induces those who experience it in a kind of stasis or suspension. That is, extreme fast gestures can become textures. Energy does not change, it remains the same. From the point of view of human agent and listener, the musical gesture process may be tactile and visual. Gesture in smallest concepts represents the fundamental strategy of structuring music, together with its complement, texture, and refers to an action directed away from a previous goal or towards a new goal and is concerned with the application of energy and its consequences. Indeed, any occurrence which seems to provoke consequence or consequence which seems to have been provoked by an occurrence. The next examples come from my own works. The first example is from a piece called Etignis Involvance. The music itself is extremely gestural. Every moment there is some sort of articulation in the energy, some progression. So by adding image, what I try to do is to have different energies moving around that would amplify the energy in the music and give it a new meaning. The energy in the image will provoke a final interpretation or an hierarchization of the gestures in the music. Thank <laughs> you. 
The next example comes from a piece called Petals, where I combine an image which is mainly textural with a music which is mainly gestural. Therefore, there are almost like two parallel paths that combine themselves in certain specific moments and help to give the shape to a larger section of the piece. The next example comes from my piece Neshama. Both music and image are very gestural. The movements of the dancer help to create a certain path in the changes of the energy. The music itself also follows a specific path, but each path followed by music and image are independent. The last example, taking from my piece Things I Have Seen in My Dreams, is an example where image and sound go together both gesturally and texturally. I try to have a very direct relation between what is happening in the image and what is happening in the sound. Thank you. 
in music an image, energy is present in motion, in time, it never disappears but can always be transformed. Causes have to exist to change the form of energy, motion forces, etc. The relationship between gestures and textures, both in image and sound, shape and mold our perception of time and propagate into our oral and visual universe or a combination of both. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Fred Colopy. I'm a professor of design and innovation at Case Western Reserve University. I'd like first to thank the organizers for putting this together under challenging circumstances, and I'd like to thank each of you for being here. I'm going to discuss a reading of the history of abstract art, specifically as it's influenced my approach to the design work on the imager visual synthesizer. Visual music origin stories generally start with the publication in 1704 of Newton's Optics. In it, Newton proposed a relationship between the seven distinct colors he saw through his prism and musical notes. He concluded that the intervals occupied by the colors aligned with those between the seven notes of the musical scale. Later, Carl Gerstner would note that Newton saw seven colors because he wanted to see seven colors in order to correlate them with the notes and not vice versa. Inspired in part by Newton's experiments, the Jesuit priest and scholar Louis Bertrand Castel argued that color, being a wave phenomenon like sound, might bring the sort of pleasure that music does. Castel chose to use a scale of 12 notes. He proposed to demonstrate his idea by modifying a harpsichord to produce color instead of sound, a mute music as he called it. He wrote that pressing its keys would bring out the colors with their combinations and their chords, in one word, with all their harmony, which would correspond exactly to that of any kind of music. Martin Francen's excellent historical account of Castell's idea suggests that though the ocular harpsichord was never fully realized, it was a cause celeb, which served as a stimulus to considerable 18th century debate. On the whole, where scientists were skeptical about his analogy between seeing and hearing, many artists felt an affinity for the idea. The influential philosopher and critic Dennis Diderot brought a deaf man to experience one of Castell's prototypes after which he wrote that the deaf mute recognized music as a special way of communicating thought, another type of speech organ. To position Castell's big idea for our purposes, let's restate it as a design brief. There is an analogy between hearing and seeing, between music and painting. Though it is not possible to make musical tones permanent, colors can be made transient. Just as we derive pleasure from combinations and sequences of musical tones, a changing interplay among colors will expand our enjoyment of them. The 19th and 20th centuries saw a succession of instruments designed with an intent akin to Castell's. And once film was available, it provided another vehicle for exploring the relationship of the eye to the ear, stretching the art to include forms and motions as well as colors. Though these origin stories connect us to those who came before us, they do little more than illuminate the constraints of each age's technologies. Designers and visual instrumentalists will, I think, find more guidance in art history, particularly the history of modern painting. As we will see, and as is, and as is even suggested by the titles of many of their works, Painters of the early decades of the 20th century had a great deal of interest in music 
and in producing effects like those of music. With Romanticism and the rise of instrumental composition, music had freed itself from the shackles of representation. With absolute music, a composer no longer had to fit music to previously defined content. Instead, a composition's form was its content. Its notes were the art. Observing this fact led Diderot to suggest that painting could follow a similar path. While the rainbow provided a foundation like music's basso continua, it was not sufficient. Drawing further on analogy with music, he argued that colorists had to take in the tones of nature's most brilliant objects and learn to harmonize them. Goethe was making the same argument a half century later when he wrote in his theory of colors that for some time painting has lacked a knowledge of the harmonic base and established an approved theory as is found in music. As painting's envy of music grew deeper, Castell's big idea continued to pop up from time to time. My favorite 19th century moment comes when the American landscape artist, Thomas Cole, who was known for paintings like this one, produced this one. On November 5th, 1834, Cole wrote in his diary, I made a small circular diagram of color today. It reminded me of an experiment I have long wished to try and have thought a good deal about. The idea was suggested by something I read when a boy. I do not know where. It is what may be called a music of colors. I believe that colors are capable of affecting the mind by combination, degree, and arrangement, like sound, he wrote. He went on to propose that an instrument by might be constructed by which color could be played and which would give to those who had cultivated their taste in art a pleasure like that given by music. As such thoughts continued to fuel developments, such as Impressionism, the essayist and critic Walter Pater offered up his now famous provocation. All art constantly aspires towards the condition of music. But what exactly is the condition of music? The musician and philosopher Patricia Herzog concluded an analysis of what Pater meant by the condition of music like this. Music is the condition toward which all the other arts constantly aspire because music's ideal content is perceived entirely and only through its own tonally moving forms. Painting, sculpture, and poetry have still to contend with representational subject matter, but music's communication of an ideal content requires nothing of the sort. The condition to which all art aspires is that of aesthetic self-sufficiency. With the rise of modernism and pure abstraction, something like what musicians had achieved through instrumental composition appeared within the grasp of painters, so that by 1911, Kandinsky declared that it was clear to him that painting was capable of developing powers of exactly the same order as music possessed. And with pure abstraction, things took off. Brian Eno, a contemporary musician and artist, summarizes simply what that period in painting was all about. At the beginning of the 20th century, the ambition of the great painters was to make paintings that were like music, which was then considered the noblest art. One critic who saw this development clearly at the time was Willard Huntington Wright. He published books about these matters first in 1915 and then again in 1923 when he wrote an extraordinary little book titled The Future of Painting, in which he argued that, the truth is that so-called modern painting is not an art of painting at all. The experiments since 1800 have been along the lines of an entirely new art, an art basically distinct from that of painting, an art whose purposes, impulses, motives, and final goal are intrinsically different from those of the art of painting. Modern painting is, in reality, an art of color. He concluded finally that in time, its artists, who included his brother, would abandon paints altogether, choosing to directly manipulate light instead. Guillaume Apollinaire was the early 20th century's most prolific art, art blogger. 
Having celebrated Louis Fuller's integration of painting, dance, and drawing, and declared, I love light more than anything else, he was especially excited in 1914 to see work by the painter Leopold Servage. In an essay titled Colored Rhythm, he reminded readers that he had predicted the coming of an art that would be to painting what music is to literature, and announced that Servage's work was it. <clears throat> Sauvage painted over 200 watercolors that he thought of as keyframes for a color film in which forms would grow, change color, and dance about the screen. This before color film stock was yet invented. When the poet Blaise Sindrar saw Sauvage's colored rhythms, he exclaimed, you think you are present at the very creation of the world. Picasso was encouraged to drop by Sauvage's studio where he drew a small sketch of Sauvage at work on one. Throughout the period, these and many other artists wrote about their experiments with painting, making uncountable references to harmony and rhythm, dissonance and timbre to music. As the Swiss modernist Carl Gerstner summarized the period in his 1986 book, The Forms of Color, the more abstract visual art became and the more it concentrated on the expressive powers of its resources, the closer it approached the oral in its essence. To organize the correspondences that artists observed, Gerstner created a framework based on the three core dimensions of each of the two arts, painting and music. In adopting his framework for visual instrument design, I have added several dimensions. Now, as we read what artists have said about the musical ideas in their work, we can organize them as propositions in this framework. For example, the most common assertion over three centuries has been that there is, or ought to be, a relationship between colors, hues, and music's pitches. The idea has come up dozens of times over the centuries. Views on the matter are all over the place. In my own experience, this has proven an unproductive avenue of pursuit for many reasons. Still, it remains a topic of interest to others. A similar idea about Hughes is that each calls to mind particular musical timbres. Kandinsky has a discursive passage in The Art of Spiritual Harmony in which he describes what he hears from each of the colors. Similar notions have been shared by others, both painters and musicians, though there is little commonality among them. My favorite of Kandinsky's observations on painting and music, though, is his poetic expression of a relationship between the pitch and amplitude of sounds and the size and thickness of visual forms. The pressure of the hand upon the bow corresponds perfectly to the pressure of the hand upon the pencil. Van Gogh wrote frequently about the role music played in his painting, seeing, for example, the relationship between pitch and the purity of colors. Dark and light colors do actually have effects that are comparable with low and high musical tones. In our instrument design process, we treat these observations like hypotheses. To explore them, we put musical and visual ideas together in brief animations. I think of these as like pencil tests that animators use while developing their ideas. Here is one that plays with those ideas from Kandinsky and Van Gogh. Many modern artists, musicians, and poets were intrigued by synesthesia, the mingling of sensory experiences and individuals. Most synesthetic relationships having to do with art and music were idiosyncratic, differing significantly among individuals who experienced them. A rare empirical study did, though, find one experience that was consistent among synesthetes. The faster the music, the sharper and more angular the visual image. Here's a test that plays with that.
Georgi Kieps, a prolific writer on technique and painting and sculpture, the so-called plastic arts, returned again and again to music for inspiration. I particularly love what he had to say about rhythm. Woodworking, hammering, swimming, rowing, walking, running, dancing are familiar activities in which meter makes work easier and at the same time endows it with a feeling of pleasure. The orderly repetition or regular alternation of optical similarities or equalities dictates the rhythm of the plastic organization. Another test explores this. Stan McDonald Wright and Morgan Russell, the founders of synchronism, were students of the color theorist Percival Tudor Hart. They thought deeply about how color combinations achieve specific emotional effects. It is only by a sense of continuity or curve in color that one can produce an effect as emotional as that of music on us, Morgan Russell wrote. And the first requisite of color, as of music, is that it be harmonious, his partner wrote. In his treatise on color, MacDonald Wright focused on identifying dissonant and harmonious color combinations. He also identified a relationship between color purity and musical dissonance. Both synchromists experimented over several decades with machines for manipulating light directly. As we learn more, we add other relationships to the framework. In doing so, I don't mean to suggest that effects are always achieved through a direct application of an idea. Rather, the, relationship rep the relationships represent interesting zones for exploration, zones which can also be employed contrapuntally or in complex combinations. The goal of exploring them is to help build languages that are as deep and as expressive as those found in music. In that spirit, Georgia O'Keeffe's abstraction serves as an invitation to step back once again to a holistic view of painting's relationship with music. O'Keeffe was, like many modern artists, a musician. She played the violin. She had read Willard Huntington Wright's work closely, and her paintings were exhibited alongside those of the synchromists whom she admired. She even referred to her abstracts as music. The Pelvis series nicely illustrates the movement in her art, here they are in the order they were presented from 1943 through 1947. Curator Barbara Haskell-L wrote, O'Keefe invented for herself a new and original language of form and color that approximated the fluid rhythms and sublimity of nature thereby allowing her to express the intangible things in herself for which she had no words. What, what O'Keefe achieved in the Pelvis series resonates with what Servage wrote a generation earlier when he advised that transformed representations should be to the forms of objects in the external world as a musical sound is to a noise. So O'Keefe, Servage, and scores of others provide us with guidance for moving Castell's design brief along. And Huntington Wright's 1923 admonition serves us as a kind of North Star. The color instrument of the future will not merely throw pretty squares, circles, coils, and volutes of colored light on a screen, but will be able to record the artist's moods, desires, and emotions along any visually formal aesthetic line. Only when such an instrument has been perfected can the modern artist's creative conceptions be properly expressed. That is, I think, where modern art was headed and remains a goal worthy of continued pursuit. Additional resources can be found on my website at rhythmiclight.com. Thank you for listening and considering.
Hi, I'm Eric Dyer. It's great to be here amongst so many kindred spirits. For the past 18 years, I've been reinventing pre-cinema optical toys like the Zoetrope to make films interactive installations. Live performances. And participatory animated sculptures. All right, quick review of the zoetrope invented in the 1830s. You spin the drum, peer through the slits into the inside of the drum, and witness the magic of animation. The slits remove the motion blur from the spinning images. Okay, so this talk is really a survey, but I do hope through sharing this work that I help show there's an expansive territory of unexplored expressive possibilities that stem from these pre-cinema optical devices. Um, this all started in 2002 when I was working as a freelance animator and making my own experimental films. I really wanted to get my hands back on the work again. I was working a lot on the screen, in front of a screen for work that would be presented on a screen. And I realized that the digital video cameras that were coming out onto the market could replace the slits of the zoetrope. So I printed out this test, spun it on a record player, and looking through the camera set with a high shutter speed, the images pop back to life. So this is exciting for me because it meant I could create films from spinning sculptures. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, when I finished my graduate studies in 2004, I went to Denmark on a Fulbright Fellowship and I went around the city videotaping the interesting kinetic moments. And I took those strips of video and printed them out on these long strips of inkjet paper and built up these paper sculptures, each about the size of a bicycle wheel. And I brought them into the studio, spun them, and shot them. And that's how I made the film, Copenhagen Cycles. And the next project called The Bellows March, I moved the process more into three-dimensional space. This is during the Second Gulf War. I was really focused on this eternal war, peace, war, destroy, create, destroy cycle we always find ourselves in. But procedurally, I wanted to make a bridge between the worlds of digital animation and physical animation. So all these sculptures were created in the computer. The animation was made uh, in the computer Sculptures were built up in digital space, and then sculptures were 3D printed, bringing the digital animation into the physical world, and then hand-painted, textured, about 18 different sculptures created to make the film, and brought into the studio and spun. So that was kind of my bridge into moving from film into sculptural work, because I also be began to show the sculptures um, in a gallery context. This is at the New Frontier Artist Exhibition at Sundance in 2007. And on the outside of that gallery space, you see these animations playing on these uh, flat screens. But then when you move into the space of the gallery, you see that those animations are actually be being created uh, live by these, these spinning sculptures in front of cameras. And then the Bellows March um, exhibited actually at Ars Electronica and also this is SIGGRAPH in 2008. Again, you see the animations on the flat screens on the outside of the space, move behind the curtain, and you see that it's these spinning sculptures that are creating the animation uh, essentially in real time. So this idea of a live camera and these spinning sequential images also opened up this universe of performance. So I 
began spinning these images under a live camera that was piped out to a projection screen. And I've worked on a number of performances, uh, but the latest um, work in progress is called Shake the World, and it's built on the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, and it's a collaboration with contemporary jazz musician and composer Rudresh Mahanthapa on the left, um, who's also the director of Princeton University's jazz program, and H. Prism on the right, who's an avant-garde hip-hop artist. It'll be about 15 to 20 movements within this performance. I'm just going to focus on the work in progress for one of these movements, and it stems from this quote from Gandhi. We are constantly being astonished these days at the amazing discoveries in the field of violence, but I maintain that far more undreamt of and seemingly impossible discoveries will be made in the field of nonviolence. So I took that idea and I thought about transforming objects of violence into something else, into something beautiful. So all these images are created uh, with bullets, uh, bullet shells, casings, and so on. These are made from nine millimeter shells, um, AK-47 in nine millimeter. Shotgun shells, AK-47, nine millimeter shotgun shells, shotgun shells. And procedurally, I want to release control a bit from the process of the motion. So I began making these complex um, arrangements of these bullets on a keyable background. And then I would hit the bottom of the, of the table with a hammer. So then I would take that footage and spread it out in a radial pattern and spin it on this variable speed turntable. And there's a magnet in the center of the turntable and the images so they snap into place. So this is with a locked camera, but also there's possibilities with a handheld camera. And you also see that there's a natural rhythm that comes with the repetition of uh, the images. And that's something we plan to start playing with as well. So these are all built on 32 frames per rotation. And so I can either hit a visual beat once every measure or double it up in two beats per measure. Okay, maintaining the same tempo, but changing up the rhythm. And here's one and three. And so the next step will be to hand this over to H Prism to start working with uh, some of the rhythm tracks for this movement. But part of the uh, challenge of performing with these images is that they're essentially set, but there's other ways to start um, working with mark making in real time. So in this example, I'm placing a marker on the spinning disc that's backlit, and the image is then inverted in the post -proce processor. And so I can make marks in real time and react to the music and have the music react to what I'm doing. And then another possibility is 
placing these laser cut um, acetate discs on top of the marks. And so wherever the holes are in the disc, the line should be showing. Now, this is, I haven't gotten to that point yet. I need some control over exposure, but you can see there's some interesting expressive po possibilities here. Another one is these multiple discs that are layered on acetate and therefore can start um, aligned. And then while spinning, I have these tabs cut into the outside. I can run my finger along the outside of the spinning disc and offset those, um, those sequences. So again, work in progress, just first draft stuff, but just to give you an idea of what some of the possibilities that are developing. This idea of using these sequences of images, spinning them and using a live camera also expanded into the realm of uh, interactivity. And uh, part of that impetus was that during this exhibition, I was showing some of these spinning manhole cover pieces that were projected onto the floor. Uh, this a woman came up and she tried to interact with the, um, with the spinning image and they weren't interactive. So I really started to think about what kind of interactivity I could incorporate into the work. And at the time I was working on another project that was putting me deep into the Maybridge motion studies. And I started to think about the moment that um, an, app, an animal's motion really captivated me. And I was lucky enough to be uh, on holiday with a friend's family, snorkeling off the coast of Spain at the age of 14 and I remember seeing this octopus underwater dart away from me and leave a cloud of ink in its wake. And that compound motion of all the tentacles and the ink cloud uh, was really captivating to me. So I made this piece, Girona Octopi. There's a live projection overhead, so you can see yourself move into the work and move within the work. And then a crank box in the middle when you turn the crank the Spanish music box melody plays, and when you spin the crank fast enough, the animation pops to life. And the crank box is kind of a minimalist version of Maybridge's supraxiscope, which he used to project his own motion studies late in life. Now, I really I wanted to get away from using uh, video as the means of experiencing the artwork, and I was hugely influenced and inspired by Gregory Barsamian's incredible animated sculptures. Um, this is one of his incredible works. And these are activated by a strobe light that flashes at about 12 frames per second. So a strobe is a way to experience the sculpture as such. But for my own work, I yearned to increase that temporal resolution, to try to eliminate as much as possible the means of the illusion. And that meant partly increasing the speed of the strobe, which has become much more uh, possible with um, LED lights. And I also wanted to get the public to be the ones activating the work. So this led to a project called Shibaminetica, which I created these two large ship's wheels, uh, ship wheel like sculptures that the public activates by spinning them. And Shibaminetica is a combination of the words Shanghai, Baltimore, Panama, and Kinetics. And it looks at industrial heydays. Um, our past and 
China's young and blossoming and uses the Panama Canal and its recent expansion as a connecting point between the two. So the images in these works come from all those, uh, from those three places and the images shot on location. And using a sensor in the back of the piece to activate these LED strobes, when the piece is first spun, it's spinning fast enough to give us strobe speeds that are past film and video, higher than film and video, and makes the strobe almost uh, imperceptible. So I was really excited about this idea and I um, ran with it, made several new pieces uh, that were shown in an exhibition called Seeking Motion Hidden at the Ronald Feldman Gallery in New York. So I developed with engineers this control system for these works that has a lot of different options that I can play with, um, including varying the number of rates and what happens when you spin the work clockwise or counterclockwise. So I have a few creative possibilities within this um, microcomputer that, uh, that we engineered. And one example of that is Mud Caves number two, which is my version of the Western landscape panorama. And instead of seeing an overall panoramic image, through motion, we see multiple perspectives on the forms within a single landscape. And each of these rings of forms has a different number of images, so there's an overall parallax effect. And the rate of the strobe changes over time, so different rings are in register at different times. Flora is a motion portrait, a kind of a tribute to Flora Muybridge, Flora Mybridge, as you say. And when F uh, Flora was the wife of Edward, she was about half his age when they married. And he was often away for months shooting landscapes. She was left alone in San Francisco and fell into a love affair with an adored actor and had a child with him. And when Edward found out about this, he went and murdered this man. And the child of the affair was orphaned. And Flora was abandoned also and died of tuberculosis at the age of 24. So another aspect of uh, using a strobe is allowing the viewer to be the one exploring and discovering the work. Uh, this piece is called Implants from 2015, and it's about uh, nine feet long and four and a half feet in diameter. And it's covered in animated sequences, 3D printed, there's laser cut elements, cloth, uh, paint, other physical elements, and as the viewer you pick up a handheld strobe flashlight and explore the outside and the inside of the sculpture. And this is meant to be a magnified, greatly magnified medical implant that fits around the optic nerve and there's thousands of tiny nanobots jumping in and out of the implant and into the body fixing things. And it's kind of, um, I have a degenerative retinal disorder that's, um, and this is sort of my fantasy cure for this um, incurable retinal disease. All right, we're, we're almost out of time. So just things I'm working on currently, um, updating the idea of the motion painting. This is one of Oscar Fischinger's uh, motion paintings, motion painting number one. 
which is a moving painting that manifests as a film. So I'm working on moving paintings that manifest as paintings. And also the very long-term zoetrope tunnel project uh, in which the audience moves through the tunnel with handheld strobe flashlights and the tunnel spins around them and wherever they point the flashlight, the animation comes to life. So we're out of time. Um, thank you very much for letting me share my work with you. Thank you for uh, these uh, great presentations. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here live. Uh, I will, uh, uh, I have to apologize. Uh, we had uh, due to uh, copyright issues, uh, problem with uh, uh, Oliveira's uh, piece. Uh, so this is something that uh, YouTube is uh, always uh, uh, checking and there is something uh, what YouTube does not like. So we had a couple of uh, uh, seconds uh, um, without uh, a video and an audio, but we can leave uh, the link to your project in the chat so that you can see uh, the project uh, that, that is online actually. Uh, so uh, it's great to have you all here. Uh, I will start with uh, Joao Petro Oliveira. You are actually uh, from uh, now uh, it's it's morning, so hello, good morning. Uh, good morning, yes. Good morning, very early. So um, you showed us uh, uh, three, four examples so with your own uh, visual experience. So I, I was wondering, uh, you have a very broad um, expertise uh, background uh, with uh, architecture and you're a composer, musician. Uh, I was wondering, uh, is this, are these uh, visual, audiovisual experiences are um, made by, the visuals are also created by, by you, actually? Yes, yes, they're created by, by me. I started uh, interested in, uh, in visuals a few years ago, so I've been trying to develop these images uh, in relation with the sound. This is quite interesting. So as a composer, it, how, how do you um, act with, with sound and visual? So what comes first uh, or is it an ongoing uh, vice versa uh, ping pong? Well, that's a complex, uh, very complex question because uh, in reality, um, how can we uh, relate something which uh, most of the time moves in time, so like music with with uh, visuals, with or paintings, if you want to talk, which are static. So, and even if they're movements, uh, how can we um, make connections between them that will uh, uh, sound organic? That is, that one is somehow connected to the other. Uh, so, of course, there are no formulas, uh, I think. Uh, so I, I tend to follow very much the, uh, the ideas which have been, which I spoke a little bit about, by like Dennis Smalley or uh, Trevor Richard or even Francois Bale, which makes an approach of sound through the Pierce theories. And how can we imagine interesting connections that are... Um, somehow based on the explorations, a kind of an internal exploration of the sound and the image. So when you, when, you, when you think of a sound, you think of a possible image that goes with it or vice versa. Uh, these are uh, three, four uh, prime examples for, uh, um, for your um, theory about uh, um, uh, 
gestural and textual uh, combinations between uh, the audio and the visual. And you showed us two examples uh, where they are connected and where they are going different paths. So was this the strategy at the beginning? So to to uh, um, use these different approaches, uh, kind of. Well, they're explored in different ways. I mean, when I when I do the when I try to make a sound which is gestural together with an image which is gestural. Uh, but they don't need to connect, so that is, they don't need to have uh, the same ongoing gesture. They probably can give an idea, still an idea of continuity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the important thing is then to find the moments where um, where they can actually get together. So you sort of you create the large scale form or the large scale phrase, which is full of several gestures and. But inside there is some, there can be some uh, um, randomness, I would say, in the way they connect. Mm -hmm. Of course, other times uh, you try to make them uh, organically connected so that one is really together with the other and reflecting the other in some way. So is a, a computer generated image without any input like motion capture or uh, gestures uh, is this, um, can it be gestural in any way? Is there um, for computer animated Im images, uh, motion graphics? Well, that's also a very difficult question because <laughs> we would have to go into the, into gesture theory. So, so basically what, what is, what is a gesture and, and specifically yeah, what, what you raised this question at the beginning. It's very complicated. Yeah, so. It's very complicated. So, uh, what is, uh, uh, a, I mean, what is a gesture which is not, which does not have a meaning, I can say a semiotic meaning that we, which is dependent on the physical gesture, let's say. So how can we uh, somehow find connections between gestures, uh, which in fact are based on materials which are not, um, uh, which are not related to the, our nowadays life and nowadays, uh, you know, the, gestural expression, so physical gestural, gestural expression. So uh, that's when I, I talked about this idea of energies, uh, which, um, uh, which can have meaning. So let's see, if you see an explosion of an image, so an image that somehow explodes, amplifies itself, changes shape, if that is interpreted significantly by somebody who's watching, it can be considered as a gesture. And of yeah. course, then you find out the music that can go with it or vice versa. Yeah. So, uh, Fred Kolopi, th thank you for your uh, comprehensive uh, overview, uh, the historical perspective, uh, very interesting in this connection of uh, abstract visual art. Um, I, was, I was wondering, uh, I, you have seen a couple of presentations uh, today already. So is, is there a connection uh, with all these uh, um, pieces in the past uh, for uh, young artists with new technology? For sure. But what is your, um, your outcome of, of your research for, for, the, for, for the new um, artists using um, audiovisual experiences? Oh, we need sound. Let me, Fred. Thanks. Oh, yeah. yeah, this has been, for me, a very, very stimulating um, couple of days and um, not, not let down at all by the last two YouTube presentations were phenomenal to me. And, and the, um, I, th I think that, uh, that, you know, what my background and work brings is a set of questions that I, th I think we're being wrestled with, at least in my sense, they're being wrestled with here. And that is, has to do with relationships amongst um, tool and technique and um, matters like improvisation and composition and how those move um, with the dialectic between the visual domain and the acoustic domain is the audio domain. You know, our brains, 
uh, and our and our sense systems are quite different. So, for example, I thought of in an earlier session today. I thought of the idea that you can have a lot of people contributing to visual art, and you don't end up with cacophony necessarily because each individual viewer can turn and look at the piece of the work that interests them, or you know, in Eric's work, even go down to the level of the moment and the work that interests them. And, and that doesn't happen in a musical setting. In a musical setting, if somebody is making noise, everybody is affected by that. And that's an interesting, um, perhaps subtle, but an interesting dynamic that could be played with and, and ought to be in some way played with. Um, so that we can have big jam circles of, you know, drum circles kind of things going on visually that would be unimaginable if we just gave everybody a penny whistle. Um, and, and and so so I think that there just are um, for me as a tool maker, really a tool designer, an instrument designer. For me, there are questions about how can I enable and support through the way that the tools I am thinking through and building no, 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 no. impact people. Yeah. Uh, mostly uh, presence. Uh, jump in, uh, but you left uh, on. Uh, yeah, um, and another question. So you came up with uh, uh, this framework from graphic designer Carl Gerstner. So and he added a couple of more aspects like uh, uh, motion animation. So and he brought a couple of uh, examples, and we have uh, seen. Uh, discussions, hidden order, for instance. Uh, right. Uh, Very good example. This uh, uh, possibilities to to bring uh, all these aspects uh, connected to motion. So, yeah. yeah, Carl would be like just thrilled. He's a he's a modernist student of Max Bill's, basically Bauhaus kind of trained. Very very influential um, uh, Swiss artist. Um, and Eric, he would adore your sculpture stuff. I mean, look at his sculptures. I mean, this guy would be all over you for you know collaboration and such. Unfortunately, he's deceased a couple of years ago, but um, but yeah, I think he'd just be immensely thrilled. And so, I, yeah, I think he's certainly for me a guiding light, and I think would expand some of the people here's thinking a little bit to because he took a very disciplined approach to trying to make sense of how these two things really fit for the human neuroprocessor. He was very keenly interested in how does it fit together? Where are the myths? Where are the realities? What do we know empirically? What do we wish were true? That kind of thing. So. Uh, I have a, another interesting question. So, um, uh, as Electronica is uh, tackling artificial intelligence, I think since 2017, and there are uh, since two years, three years, uh, is this connection artificial and music uh, so they came up they came up with projects with unfinished compositions and they were trained etc and i was wondering because uh, you concluded with a quote uh, by uh, willard huntington wright uh, mm -hmm. talking on this color instrument for the future and i was mm -hmm. thinking about um, artificial intelligence that is analyzing your research and bringing uh, new um, combinations so is this uh, what do you think about this? Um, so, yeah. yeah, so I think there's stuff there that will be fun for somebody. I don't think it's going to be fun for me in particular. I'm, I'm really, for me, the model is the jazz ensemble uh, with an added player. And that player is playing the visual channel. And it's really about the human communication that happens among a group of musicians being expanded to include this second sense. That's really, the for me, the driving motivation is to play with others, to play specifically with musicians, uh, bringing the vocabulary of sight and image to bear on their revision of what they're doing and how they're playing, to get them to view me as a player, as a fully enfranchised member of the group who takes solos and assumes the lead and hands off in the same way that the musicians have traditionally done with one another. And that's a big enough project for a lifetime in my view. So I'm interested in all of the other things that 
people are thinking about and working on, but but I have a, a an observer's interest. Eric Dea, so uh, it's perfect uh, in this context of uh, the topic um, of uh, expanded animation, the appeal of the analog. But before we talk about this uh, aspect, um, um, the question uh, concerning uh, your work with audio. So you mentioned a couple of uh, uh, projects, uh, Shake the World, uh, working with uh, chess musicians and avant-garde hip hop artists. Uh, uh, there was, of course, uh, the sound design uh, at the beginning, and you worked with that, but then you uh, developed a kind of interactive VeChain tool. So uh, these are quite interesting projects. So the question is, uh, um, is there still uh, a lot of research to do possibilities for these interactive pseudopod cinema toys for, for this audiovisual interactive experience in your yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I come, I sort of come from a background as a filmmaker, and so originally audio and and sound was very much sort of like scoring to the to the visuals or reacting to visuals to pre-recorded sound, and then the finished product was something that was uh, you know pre-recorded and presented. So now it's how can I make choices in real time. Um, that can react to the music and that uh, the music can react to what I'm doing. We can have this sort of conversation just like what Fred was talking about. Um, and yeah, it's just <laughs> with uh, this pre-cinema, zoetrope, pinakistoscope um, world, it just feels like there's rabbit hole after rabbit hole to dive into. And this is just one of them. Um, and it's 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 challenging to figure out how to be improvisational within um, you know this sort of system that I've been working with, um, but it's been really interesting to think about that and really be be pushed by these mus musicians who are used to working in an improvisational context and to sort of enter their world and be able to um, be uh, fluid to some extent. Um, yeah, so I'm just in, deep in it right now. Um, working with those ideas and not every movement is going to be me finding ways to um, be improvisational. Some things will be, um, my visuals be, will be more ambient. Um, but in some cases, I am going to really work to make it uh, something I'm creating in the moment. Can, can I leap in and respond to Eric? I, I, one thing that comes to my mind as I listen to you and having watched your work is, is um, Lyle Mays, the uh, pianist, composer, jazz composer, pianist, um, also died recently last year. And he, um, he, he said on one occasion to me that um, when I was asking about improvisation, he says, improvisation is just composition done really fast. Okay. <laughs> so take all of your thoughts about how you compose ordinarily and ask yourself how you can speed it up. Uh huh. And, so I I have found that a really useful useful thought, and that seems to make a parallel with animation really well because animation oftentimes is a very frame by frame, which is kind of like a note by note building process, uh, image by image. But how can that happen very fast? <laughs> and I, I don't you know we have a composer he may think no they're totally I'd be curious. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. Yeah. What what, what uh, John, yeah yeah no no it's uh yeah you're right I mean the uh improvisation is 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 a composition done really fast what that implies is very interesting because it implies a very strong knowledge of technique uh and how to apply it how to apply it in the minute uh usually when we talk about improvisation and uh uh, there are many different schools. I mean, there's the jazz school, there's the, the, the organ players uh, school of improvisation. There's a, there are a lot, a lot of different uh, aspects. But for most of the times, what improvisers think of is uh, pre-constructed blocks. It is, uh, you have uh, blocks of material that you use in certain moments and you change them according to the needs. So, of course, in the moment, you change them, you you modify them, etc. So, um, on the other hand, I think about, for example, some of the, the composition 
using electronic sounds uh, are the opposite. It's like an improvisation where time is extended so that you work like a laboratory. So the, the process is, the, is completely the inverse process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, yeah, that's a really interesting way about think about making art in an improvisational way that it might not be happening in real time, but very slowly you're building something up that you're having an improvisational mindset and then the finished product um, is, a, is a series of improvisations uh, pulled together. That's really interesting. Yeah, so when Robert Moog was just, you know, inventing the synthesizer, the audio synthesizer, just developing it, one of the things he noticed was the inordinate amounts of time that people spent in very slow movements of a, a control while they were discovering the space to build up, you know, to begin to build up sounds. and. And I think it comes back um, to your, Jurgen, to your question about artificial intelligence. There may well be an augmentation role in all of these models that we're approaching this with for AI to take away some of the time of, that Moog observed these musicians having to fuss with a knob and kind of move us through some of that a little more quickly. I don't know. Oh, technology, of course, can help us to, to with with all these. Uh, um, uh, building blocks that we have in our uh, um, for improvisation actually yeah, yeah I will uh, um, um, address uh, the the topic uh, to you the appeal of the analog the return to the material as a as a last question to all of you so uh, how can the appeal of the analog the haptic feedback and analog experience the material be brought? together in the audio visual uh, as uh, Eric, for instance, uh, in, in his project, but also in this combination of new technologies. So is there, um, is it kind of a nostalgia, is it a form of nostalgic or might it be a new way to bring this uh, analog uh, uh, and digital uh, artificial intelligence supported uh, technologies together? Yeah, I, I, I I'll just start by thinking about process because um, I work a lot in the digital space and also in the physical space when I'm making the work. And I, I'm just observing my own um, emotions while if after six, seven hours working at a computer, um, I feel like, a, like an irritated zombie uh, when I'm finished. But after six, seven hours of working with my hands and standing and moving around the room and working with uh, materials, I might be exhausted, but I still feel good. <laughs> so I, I feel like I just have started to observe that when I'm working uh, in front of the computer that I'm using so little of my physical self. You know, I'm, I'm scrolling uh, with this finger and moving my hand around with the mouse and staring at the screen. But when I'm working with um, all the real world materials, I'm using a lot more of my senses. I'm smelling paint or, or clay or bullets and I'm working with my hands and I'm moving around my studio space. And um, I'm, I, I'm just starting to pay attention to how many senses are engaged in different parts of the, of the creative process. Um, but also I'm completely um, hyper enabled by digital technology. And so I'm trying to find, um, you know, kind of a balance between that and my process and, and my processes. And I can go on to the experience of the work. Um, I, I also have thought about how we're all working and playing and socializing in virtual spaces in front of screens. And I feel like we're, we're, we're losing that kind of, uh, or, or we miss that um, interaction, especially now <laughs> during pandemic times, we, we miss that face-to-face -face interaction. We, we miss um, handshakes and hugs. We miss, um, you know, uh, interacting in ways that we had for thousands of years before digital space came around. And so when I see people interact with my work and that sort of sense of wonder and wow and excitement, I, I feel like they're kind of re-experiencing parts of themselves that have kind of been um, lost or ab uh, abandoned through the technology, not to put the technology down because it's, again, it's hyper enabling, it's amazing, um, but it's something to, to consider um, how we're interacting with, with our world. We are running out of time, and I think this was a very uh, 
brilliant uh, closing note by uh, Eric Deja. Uh, thank you to uh, Fred Colopi, to Charles Paulo, Oliviera, and Eric Deja for uh, your great contribution. Um, uh, we will uh, have uh, the closing note in a couple of uh, minutes. I think so. We should, so please uh, stay tuned. And the video will be online uh, soon. So thank you and bye bye. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, back, uh, welcome back to the keynote. And uh, I'm very happy that we have uh, online Rose Bond and Pegita Hosea. Rose Bond, uh, is, it's uh, early in the morning, I just uh, heard. So you got up directly <laughs> right. in, in this live chat. So this is uh, um, a very interesting uh, situation for uh, live chats. So we have different time zones and uh, we are very happy that you are here. And also, Birgitta, how is the situation in uh, London Eclectic? It's great here. We have sunshine and we have a venue where we can sit outside as well as being indoors. So we're having a great day. Uh, I'm jealous. So I have a lot of uh, nice black uh, 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 bowls that I see in, in my studio. <laughs> um, yeah, and here in Oregon, we're under very hazardous conditions. Yeah. So it's uh, one thing on top of the other here. So, yeah, you yeah. Know. But yeah. the fire is not in the city. Uh, it's about 10 miles from the city. Okay. Yeah. We, we planned um, an, a screening uh, in Portland, Oregon, and it, it, it's not taking place, unfortunately. Yeah, this is very, sweet. very smoky here. Yeah. yeah. But there will be a, a screening in later, but yeah. Thank you. So the situation is quite okay. So uh, it's getting better, and uh, we may get rain. So um, climate change is very real, folks. Yeah, yeah. very real. So um, I've got some questions that I'd like to ask you, Rose, about your work, oh, um, um, which is absolutely amazing. And I just wanted to congratulate you on getting together such an impressive and ambitious um, piece of work. And um, we've talked a lot today with all the different speakers about the relationships between music and visuals and different methods for putting music to visuals. And I was just um, to start off wondering about your working process. Did you use a traditional dope sheet or did you use some kind of graphic score? How did you work out what would happen when and, and synchronize it? How did you plan it out? Or did you just kind of do it by trial and error on the computer on the timeline? Uh, no, no trial and error. Um, it, it's, 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 I'll just do like maybe three, three basic steps. The first is just to just listen, listen, listen. I make a spreadsheet and I just chunk out what I think are the, the segments, kind of the, um, if you use a, uh, the sentences, the paragraphs, that, that kind of like what, what parts go together and how long are they? And then I'm um, just like thinking, uh, just jotting down in pencil, what comes to mind, whether that's, uh, something I visualize or whether it's something I feel, uh, sometimes I see things, uh, other times it's got a feel to it. And so I'll make those very quick notes and do it movement by movement. Uh, and then after that, what do I do? Um, looking back, it, it just seems overwhelming uh, that I did it, but it's just step by step, I think. Um, and then it's a, it's, um, I think then it's a, it's a, it's research. It's like looking into, uh, especially with this piece like Barrio. Barrio uh, was sampling other music, he was, uh, you know, he was sampling literature. And so I needed to learn what those sample, what he was sampling. And it, it turned me toward this year of 1968. Uh, 1968 was when the music was composed. 1968 uh, was a year before 2020 was kind of one of those big, big years. Uh, there were ass assassinations of Martin Luther King in April, uh, in May, uh, Paris erupted in, in, in protests and riots. Uh, in June, Robert Kennedy, the presidential um, candidate was assassinated. In July was the summer of love in San Francisco. And all through the fall, there were Vietnam protests just tearing up campuses. Uh, so yeah, big, a big year. Um, so it was feeding in all of that. And then I got the idea that since he was sampling, what I would do is I would sample visually. And so I just began to collect images from that time. Some of those images are iconic. Uh, Rosa Parks uh, taking a seat on the bus, the lunch counter, 
You know, some of the things are iconic. Other things, maybe not so much. You just kind of Google in things and see what pops up. So uh, what I then, it's kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together and animating in and out of those um, iconic images. And the other thing that I was thinking about in relationship today, um, a few of the papers were looking at, um, you know, sort of direct translations of sound into image, how you might take, you know, sort of use a computer program almost and um, take, for example, the complexity of a sound wave to generate a particular color. So this is not how you worked. You didn't do a direct translation of the sound into visuals. And what do you think the artist brings to the interpretation of sound that um, a direct translation from a computer program can never do? What, what was well, I, the artist's I, I, contribution? Yeah, I, I, I think I think you're right. I think um, in a way that the you know I don't do generative programming. Um, I spoke in my talk a little bit about I like a gap between the music and the image. Uh, if it's too right on, I get bored or it gets predictive. Now, I will say a really, really good programmer, you know, in the hands of uh, a person, I think Rafik Anadol is, a, is one of those people that it's, it, the generative takes on another thing, but a lot of time it's kind of club music to me. Um, and so uh, there, were just, there was just so much more room um, to do a dance, kind of, I, I, I see my work as choreographing time. Uh, and so I've got to have a hand in that. And there's times when the screen goes black and there's lots of sound happen, but you sort of need that gap then for something else visual to come in. So I see myself as the aloof dance partner to the orchestra at times. And I was also thinking in relation to that of Mary Ellen Butte and work she did like Tarantella in which she almost dances with the music and over the music and across the music and she doesn't directly translate the music. She uh, responds to it. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, so another thing I was thinking about in relation to your work is that this is the second project you've done for Portland Symphony Orchestra, isn't it? And the second right. time you've worked with Messian. And um, um, no, no, the first one was Messian. This one is Burial. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Burial. Sorry. Mes mi mixing it up. So it's the second one you've, one you've done with the orchestra, though. And um, what, what do you think you've learned from working with music like this? Because you've had to go into a lot of depth with this music. Whereas in the past, I imagine your animation work has come first and, and then the sound has been composed afterwards to go with it. So do you think you've learned anything from these two pieces of work you've done for music? Have you learned anything from the music that you might bring into your next project? Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, you're, you, you're always, I think, looking for a new way to work, a new way to be inspired. Um, in some ways, having that sound, I mean, to me was sort of a relief in a way. Otherwise, I mean, it's just you and the blank white paper, you know? And with this, um, when you have that sound and especially uh, a rich and varied, um, like Berio, there's just, and Messi on the same way, there's so much range in the music. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the, the music terminology. I don't know how to, I don't have the vocabulary around that, but it's it's like it's it's so much inspiration that is there. It's let's try like picking and choosing which of it to use, uh, you know, and sort of coming up with this mantra uh, because these pieces are so complex and the orchestras are so huge. It's like I just kept saying to Zach, who's my my compositor, it's like Zach, less is best. Less is best. You know, let's um, let's give people some room. You know, here the the um, to assimilate kind of both of them. It's like I think, especially with the the Messian piece, Turn Galila, that starts out like so uh, assaultively. You know, it's like wow, I've got to you know bring these people through an hour and twenty minutes and ten movements. 
we've got to give them a relief <laughs> at times or and the, and the music itself does that but to think um visually uh, uh how that is it's very exciting because there's no this isn't i don't know it's not done that much um orchestras and classical music has kind of been like who would who would do that you know it's like we already had fantasia you know why would you even try to do classical sort of whatever this even though these pieces i chose are avant-garde classical there's one interesting thing about your approach is although you do have some abstract images unlike fantasia and and, and say um, fishing hour and whatever you have chosen to put some figurative animation in there some historical animation in there and, and even some quite political imagery did you want to say anything about about that from 1968 um, does it relate to the situation in america today i think that you're living in portland today oh, it's so it's so um it is just so right dead on um and the whole fifth movement is all about hong kong so it sort of starts with uh, the French. The first movement is Paris, you know, and the second movement is MLK, you know, it's called O King, it's Martin Luther King. Uh, and so you, you just go on. He wrote the first four movements and then a year later, he wrote the fifth one. And um, that's where I felt like, Messi, uh, uh, Barrio was like looking back to Mahler, like he was looking back 50 years and sampling, uh, well, he called it quoting, uh, whole passages, whole, whole movements practically. Um, and so I thought, uh, I thought, uh, but then it's like, when does it get present? And I think that's where I thought, okay, the fifth movement, I can bring that right into the present. Um, and see, even though those movements are very, very different, uh, the French, um, you know, it's like a lot of economic Marxist stuff. I don't want to get too nerdy here, but then, you know, MLK here in the United States and the whole civil rights thing, and then something very, very different. Uh, it's not an anti-capitalist thing going on in Hong Kong, but still a people's, a people's protest as well. So um, I think my work has always had a political strain to it. Um, so that's, that's nothing new. I, I, uh, I do make, I do make work uh, to uh, express a voice that I don't think is there. So, uh, so yeah. And, and back to the technical side, I was thinking a lot of today, we've seen a few different kind of immersive works from installations to VR pieces. And a few times people have talked about Wagner's idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the complete work of art that brings together all art forms. Did, yeah. did you feel that way working with an orchestra? Oh my God, uh, Brigitte, when you're up in the cheap seats at the top and that music is just coming up and the, the way that the, the projection is, is it embraces you. It comes around the walls and there's no screens. It's just projected on the walls. So, and they're all curly cue and everything. And so the room tends to disappear and then reappear. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm just the, the yeah, it, it was just an absolutely thrilling experience and people misbehaved very much during the performance. They were clapping, uh, they were yelling expletives of delight. I mean, it was really, uh, it was, I think that's why the symphony came back and said, let's do it again. You know, it was uh, taking a sleepy older uh, symphony uh, and just really injecting it with, um, uh, it was a much younger audience. It just, uh, the kind of energy that was there. And I think to me, what I saw in the work, and we just had a VR a showcase here, the Venice uh, Biennale uh, was here at the Northwest Film Center. So I was there yesterday. Uh, and it's just like the potential here. It's just like, what is it, you know? Uh, and I think that's, we're on this frontier now, which I find uh, to be here now is really exciting, exciting for me. And I'm sure others, yeah. Oh, I've been kind of hogging you. Did you want to ask any questions, Jürgen? Hey, I was just wondering, we, uh, we tackled the question, uh, improvisation in, in, in music and 
animation. So as a musician, uh, you have uh, different approaches, for instance, jazz. So you, you need a couple of uh, blocks. Uh, this is the basis for improvisation. So uh, is this an important aspect in your approach uh, to have a kind of uh, um, building blocks of uh, ideas that you can use for improvisation or is like you started with an idea or listening and then you have an exact uh, um, storyboard and you know what to do right but because it's live and we're performing it live and it's not generative we have to have some way of like accounting for oh they just missed that whole section or they did what so i'm using more of a theatrical approach so cues so what you're talking about is in a sense uh kind of like a vj of having loops um that i, I that's kind of a dream of mine i you know to to do, uh, I'm really, really interested in doing more of this kind of work and possibly uh, with a smaller, you know, like maybe three instruments or whatever. Yeah. And to be able to have still that maybe multi-screen thing going on, which I think is really important to my work now, but um, other ways to, uh, to trigger, you know, but I think there's still, for me, the way I'm working, if I'm not working generatively, I still have to have this, uh, Pre, preformed. I mean, I have to have uh, work that's uh, like like there. Yeah. Uh, there is also a kind of improvisation in in your animation process, actually. So, uh, thinking about okay, how to connect it with the audio, and then there is always uh, um, a thing that you are testing and see is this okay, and there is an improvisation as well in the process. Exactly. And what we're using is uh, sort of After Effects and Cinema 4D. So everything you've seen, we've like tested and then we can adjust frame rates. We can, um, you know, like what appears on what screen area, you mm. know, all of that. Uh, uh, and then we know where we can kind of let it roll, you know, like, like a movement is never going to be the same amount of seconds in length or whatever. It's always going to be different yeah. so it's like what are the times where we could build in for that difference and what are times where it needs to be more right on but what i've learned is and i've learned this i think from um the drawing on film and if you think back uh to uh, mclaren's uh beyond all care or you know or uh brackages moth light or whatever even though that didn't have sound but the, if you um you do this exercise, we do this exercise with our students where we have them draw on clear leader and then we run it through a projector and we say, okay, someone picked the music. So someone streams something, you know, and we see the piece in one way and then we put a different piece of music to it and then we, we see it differently, you know. So it, I know that about our minds that we are always, always trying to make meaning out of these things. We're always trying to start, you know, sort of like make these patterns and so it's um, allowing for when there's a lot going on to think about, okay, I don't have to hit every single one because if we have this here, this here, people are gonna be looking around and they will, they will find their way. They'll find the breadcrumbs through the, through the boards, yeah. And do you have a date for re-performing um, the work or is it on hold? Uh, all I have, Brigitte, is a discussion, a oh. live discussion um, of where people, we've we prepared like a flat version, and I can't remember who spoke about that today, the trouble, uh, the difficulty in taking these dimensional works and making them a rectangular flat piece uh, and still capture something of what was going on. So um, <clears throat> I can appreciate that. But yeah, they they just looked at it and just emailed me right back uh, and left me a phone message and everything like, whoa, whoa, this is, we have to do this somehow. So it's a huge production. And uh, the group Roomful of Teeth is phenomenal. Um, I have to say a special thanks to the Seattle Symphony that gave me permission to use their excerpt because the music that you hear is really my scratch track. Um, so, thank you to them. 
Did we have any questions on the chat? I haven't checked. I think uh, I've not seen a question. Oh, there is a question. From Eric Dyer. Yeah. Eric oh, Dyer. Yeah. Eric Dyer says, Rose, the visuals are stunning. Um, even viewing them on the computer screen, I can only imagine what it's like to actually be there. Can you talk a little bit more about scale and immersion? Yeah, scale. Um, I think that, that that's something from my first installation uh, in Old Town, just uh, putting projectors behind windows and having people out in the street look up uh, is is, uh, you know, that the sense, what is the, the scale? And this, the thing I like to do, I like to move between representation and abstraction. So what, um, how big, how big thing should be, you know, how, you know, all that kind of stuff. But to get back to Eric's question, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that it's just a huge space. I mean, we had, I don't know, we had a lot of projectors, uh, 20K and 30K projectors, like eight or 10 of them, you know, to, to fill that area. So um, it's, um, I think with Turanga Leela, I think I gave people a lot of neck aches, you know, <laughs> kind of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, those front row seats were not so good, I'm sorry. Uh, but, uh, I think that with the burial piece now, you sort of, you like you learn about a room, you kind of learn a little bit about, you know, how far you can push people and, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. And of course, these spaces were never built for this. Never ever uh, would someone have dreamed about uh, projecting images on these curly Q Baroque walls. So, yeah. But yeah, the scale is, uh, that's one of the most exciting things. And I think that's the most transcendent for me because I'm looking at these images for hundreds, you know, so like so many times, but when you're in the, in the room and the space itself and you see them, they take on that, that scale. It's like, that's, it's a whole nother thing. It's like, it's not even sort of mine anymore. It's like of the room. It's just of the room. Yeah, I find that sometimes as I'm as I'm getting into VR that I sometimes get neck ache because I'm literally just having to look all around <laughs> all the time yeah. to see it and then yeah, overextending the neck. I think, I think you're right. I was doing that yesterday too. And it, it's sort of like, I think that's something that we're, we're going to learn. Um, but it's definitely, uh, I totally agree. So it's a huge difference, the size of the scenery. How do you experience the visuals. Mm. Uh, yeah, you're going you have a space there, right? The deep space. Can yeah. you talk about that a bit? What is that um, for people that aren't? Sure. Um, um, it's it's a uh, um, so it's actually started with uh, uh, the cave. Uh, this is uh, an invention by Denson Dean with a, a, a VR setting that is uh, kind of three, three, three to three uh, square meters. And with uh, the new um, building of the Yas Electronica Center, they extended uh, this setting and they call it deep space. Uh, we have a, a huge uh, a screen a front projection and the bottom uh, projection, and it's a playground for artists. So it's really, um, with a, you can use a lot of technologies and you can go directly to this uh, uh, um, projection. So we have a really precise projection, so it's, uh, really immersive and you can use it uh, of course with a distance but this is kind of um, yeah if if we have a collaboration with artists we always have to try uh, to see if this uh, work fits if we can use the bottom projection or should we scale it or uh, should we adapt it so this is it, it makes a difference even the position where the people are uh, is, is huge impact on, on the experience and it's 8K, isn't it, Jürgen? It's, it's 8K, 8K, front and bottom projection. Wow. And, uh, uh, it, it, it's great to have this uh, precise uh, projection where you can really go to this projection. Yeah. Wow. It's, yeah, it would, would be great to have a, a kind of collaboration to bring uh, your artwork in this setting as well. Uh, and this is really something that we 
cannot do uh, until uh, we have this pandemic, but uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to think about collaborations in this kind of settings. Yeah, yeah let's, let's hope it's over soon and hope everybody's keeping safe and well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We're probably drawing to a close now, aren't we, for our session? Yeah, I think so. Well, let me see if there's another question. Is there another question? No. There isn't another question? No. We should say thank you very much to all of our speakers today because they've all been amazing and really interesting. And it's been great to have people from the fields of music and the fields of animation and the fields of technology all coming together to um, talk across disciplines. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, waking me up. Uh, no, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I did see, I, I watched almost all the talks yesterday and I, I saw the program last night. So uh, I'm, um, yeah, so glad that you, I know it took so much work to get all this together, Jürgen, and thanks to Nana, thanks to you, Bergita, for um, all that you've done to open this up to us. Um, I think I, I heard some people talk to, or I guess today, yesterday, what, you know, um, just the kind of ideas and the kind of things that people are talking about just makes me wish, oh man, I wish I could go out for a beer with you, you know? Yeah. I think that, uh, uh, I think there's just so much that's happening right now and I'm just so happy to be part of it and to be with people who put that work in and, and make it all happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you, yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Pikita and uh, uh, Rose, uh, for uh, for this uh, for the collaboration. Actually, I'm so happy. So we we are tackling this uh, symposium, expanded animation, with this context of media art since years, and I'm I'm very uh, happy about this evolution. Actually, so now we have uh, Pikita. Uh, uh, on board with uh, uh, this, with all these exp experiences, uh, with your expertise in the field of expanded animation and draws as well. So, uh, and, and this is something that I'm, I'm makes me really happy that that it started as a small idea with this uh, free as electronica context, uh, computer film filmmaking in this expanded cinema context, and now we have 2020, and we we are still. I have so many ideas and uh, possibilities to to expand uh, our ideas, and that's mm -hmm. what makes me so much more to come. Yes, hey. I think so. Yeah, and also thank you to uh, the University of Applied Sciences of Austria Hagenberg for the support for uh, the University uh, for Creative Arts uh, Farnham, and I and my team. I cannot show it show the teammates, uh, but uh, thank you for for the great support. Uh, it's always challenging, uh, but this year it was very challenging. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we will see each other in, in a real setting soon, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you, okay. Anne. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye.